Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a lovely lunch. Um, I know I'll be comp competing with your digestive system for attention now, so I'll do my best. Uh, so I'm remote presenting in here from, from Ireland, and I work with a higher level inst institute called Hibernia College. My role at Hibernia College is that I'm the research and technology lead in, in digital learning. I've been working in this space for 25 years, um, a fascination with learning and an interest in IT and where they mix uh, and looking for, um, always looking for that convergence of technology to make learning easier. I'm known in my department kind of as the minister for the future, uh, which typically means that I'm an educational technologist with a focus on the future. Um, what technologies are coming down the line? How can we organize ourselves for them? Are we using the best technologies in our online offering as we should be? Hibernia College as an institute is, is quite unique, I think. It started in the year 2000, and it started as a institute that was going to offer higher level education through blended learning. So essentially, the mix of the blend is 50-50. So 50% 50 of our students do their work in an online context, and the other 50% is done together and in, in person and in placement. But Hibernia College has no classrooms, no physical classrooms, um, no, no buildings. It was conceived at the beginning as a digital entity. And currently we have uh, 2,500 students with a focus on postgraduate teacher training and undergraduate uh, nursing also. Um, Hibernia College is the largest provider of primary school teachers in Ireland. So we have uh, great success in deploying our blended learning methods um, within that space. As some context for this presentation, um, about three years ago, we created a series of workshops um, for um, all staff to try and figure out what my teaching and learning look like in the next uh, five to eight years at the college. And we heard voices from all staff, all faculty, all students. And we collected all of that data from the workshops and led a complete overhaul of our VLE. And part of this project is, is, um, a, a, as is part of that. The first phase of our project focused on students and the most important people in our our learning ecosystem and you know we went through an entire uh, ux process with them and redeveloped our learning management system moodle and um, customized it completely for them at, at a huge cost and um, but with great benefit and great effect after students then we started looking at the other users of the system and in particular adjunct faculty within the college um, and we will be moving on to uh, full-time faculty and staff um, next in our study. So just to give you a place on the timeline um, where I'm working with. Hiberni College has about has 500 adjunct faculty working. These are professionals that work um, during the day and they come and work with us in the evenings and at weekends to help us deliver our programs. Uh, they're contractors. And the biggest groups really would be tutors who support um, student placement, um, research supervisors who help uh, guide students to writing dissertations and in correcting them, and then academic tutors. Um, so we have full-time faculty, but we also rely on a lot of adjunct tutors who we can, we have the advantage where we can find experts in their field um, to come and help us. So really those three groups are the groups that I focused on on this stage of the progress or of the project to find out how can I make our systems better for them? And it's just to emphasize the fact that, um, as I said, we've no buildings. We don't meet people really in corridors that much to, to talk about problems. So really the success of our digital infrastructure and of our user experience across all users is vital to the success um, of, of teaching, learning and assessment in the college. Um, so so why, why do we have to change anything in the first place? Why can't you just use maybe Moodle and uh, systems like that and just leave them alone? Well, I guess you could, but from, from you know, as, as everybody's known, there's been such a, 
amount of investment that has gone into mobile apps um into the web in general you know generally driven by commerce and, and maybe social connection as well that how can an open source system like moodle mahara or wordpress compete with you know uh, some sort of cool app that has had millions or perhaps billions of dollars or euro uh, but but sorry but into it to make it effective um because if students are used students or staff are used to using these types of um apps and websites then they come to an open source system perhaps and they go that doesn't look as good in fact it looks really old you know why are you using an old system but technically you're not using an old system i think that's just part and parcel of some open source um systems by their heritage how old they are they just don't have the investment and sometimes that disconnect can reflect poorly um with your students or with your users because they think oh your systems are old compared to the systems I, I i'm used to using um obviously wordpress has grabbed this issue you know uh, and done a wonderful job uh, with gutenberg uh, to modernize uh, the whole system so really what i want to do is to try and understand a little bit more about what learning management system um, that you use um, in your college because we use Moodle, but I don't assume everybody uses Moodle. So I'd like to learn a little bit more about whether the problems that we face here are the same problems that you face out there in the wild. So if you have a phone or a laptop, um, you can scan the QR code on the screen there. Or you can just go to wooclap.com and type in that event code. So I'll just give you a minute to do that. And there's just a simple question then that I'll release um, where you can uh, write in your answer. So you have two options, scan the barcode on the screen or go to wooclap.com in your browser. You don't need to log in and type in the event code ZCQQK0. And you only have to do this once, by the way. Okay, so I'm going to move to the next slide, which will release the question. Okay, so if you've logged in there, just type in the um, systems that you use as your LMS. I'm interested to see. I'm sure they're all big players in there. I can see Moodle is a center conversation, yeah. Very good. WordPress has an LMS in the middle. That is interesting. I definitely like to know more about that. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. That is interesting there to see. Canvas seems to have won the battle in the middle there. Very good. Okay. Thank you for that. So I want to talk about the approach that I used to collect requirements um, from adjunct faculty. And I think the main problem is they can collect all the requirements that you want, but if you have no way of turning those requirements into a useful uh, website or UI, then what's the point? Um, but I do solve that problem using Gutenberg. By the end, you will understand um, how I solved that problem. So user-centered design is an, becoming a very central um, process to what we do at Hibernia College because we rely so much on digital infrastructure um, to interact with all of the users in the college. Um, we also use, I'll talk a little bit about design thinking, just the method about how we approach the design of the system. And um, once we figure out, you know, how we want to, to get the requirements. And then just talk about this idea of activity focused design and that was really just an approach that became apparent after going through the first two steps as a way to really deliver a solution um, to make our systems absolutely tuned into the needs of our adjunct faculty. And just put this into context, um, I'm going to talk about 
Uh, I can't find a de definition for user-centered design, but that's okay. I found a de definition for human-centered design. And the difference is, is that user-centered design is a subset of human-centered design, where human-centered design is about designing a solution for all humans. Maybe that's the gear stick in the car um, or the shift stick. Um, and then user-centered design is just a subset of that, where you're just looking to build a solution based on the needs of a specific user group. And that might seem obvious, but anybody who's looked in this field, you see user-centered design and human-centered design talked about, and it can get a bit confusing, but hopefully I've clarified that. As a definition, human-centered design is an approach to interactive systems that aims to make the systems usable and useful by focusing on the users, their needs and requirements, and by applying human factors and ergonomics and usability knowledge and techniques, right? That's an ISO definition of it there. But look at what's the key bits here I've highlighted in bold. When you design a system, you definitely want to make it usable and useful. Focusing on the users. I mean, this just addresses the issue that as a designer, I don't want to make the mistake of designing the system I think adjunct faculty needs based on my understanding. I'm going to ask them directly um, because my experience as uh, an ad, as a developer or educational technologist is not their experience of using our system. So they're two very different things. And, you know, I'm focusing on the users, I'm collecting their needs and requirements, and then I'm using evidence-based um, usability knowledge and techniques or ergonomics to make their experience as, as good as possible. Design thinking, it's a five-stage process. It starts with empathize and really empathize for me. I don't make it any more complicated than talking to people. <laughs> tell me what you do, tell me what problems you have one to in a focus group or one-to-one, -one, but it's that interaction. You have to get knowledge from the source to the problem. That helps you define the problems uh, much clearer. Go through a process of ideation. Well, how can we fix this? Is this a problem that can be fixed on our platforms? Um, can it be fixed another way? Does it require organizational change before we go anywhere? But this five-stage process is not a linear process. It's a, it's it's uh, it's back and forth all the time. Um, you prototype, rapid prototype. You go back. You ask, is this what you expect? You know, and, and further up to testing then with a wider audience in the field. So it's constantly going back to validate itself. Activity focused design then is something that emerged when we went through the process of um, design thinking. And, you know, through a user centered lens, activity focused design kind of, you know, when, when people, when you talk to people about systems, sometimes they express frustration. Um, you know, due to things that don't work. And you really have to look through that to find find the things that you can fix, you know. So activity-focused design centers on the actions people need or want to take in order to reach a goal. And, you know, that's sitting down. You have to determine the high-level goals that a person needs to achieve. So with the junk faculty, as I said, they kind of work in the evening and weekends, so they don't have a lot of time. And when they log on to our systems, they have a set number of tasks that they need to do. So really, it's about asking them, look, what are the goals that you need to achieve to, in order to fulfill your contract with us? And let's break those goals down into the tasks that you need to do on our system to achieve the goals. And at that point, then you can document them and compare them across a, um, a group of people that you interview. And you analyze the goals, um, obviously, to improve outcomes. So the study that I did, I took five members from each group of adjunct faculty, five placement tutors, five research supervisors, five academic tutors. I, why did I pick five? It was just a guess. Um, and based on the amount of time I had, but I did feel for me that going above five would have had limited returns because any of the five people that I took in the group had um, very similar complaints within our system. So I guess each system is different. I think getting that number of five right, you'll find out yourself whether going above that actually brings any new problems. Usually you get a lot of edge problems once you increase that number that are really difficult to fix. 
um, but certainly five members can get a lot of common problems that, that can be tackled. Each member, I did a 30 minute one to one Zoom interview with them. Um, the people selected were recommended to me by faculty um, as people who were good at sharing, um, who are used to using our systems, or perhaps new people that had expressed frustration in using our systems. So they were recommended to me. The, there was a wide experience range from experts all the way down to people that had only been using the system for maybe two or three months. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting. Experts who have been using the system for 10 years say, no, it's fine, everything works. But beginners really show you the problems. But that's because the experts had 10 years to overcome challenges that we pose to them in our um, through our UIs and through our websites. I talked to each person one to one and said, show me the things that you need to do. What tasks do you need to do today when you log on? What are you expecting to do this week? And every time the person talked about, oh, well, I do this on your system, I do that. I said, show me on your screen, do a screen share. And I recorded every single interview and the screen share for detailed analysis. And each one of those 30 minutes was like a valuable source of information. Every comment made by the user was absolutely invaluable um, in, in just understanding the problem set. So, yep, this is kind of what it looks like. You know, you have uh, transcriptions of interviewees and um, you go through each interview, write every point down, and then you can tie them together. The common issues can be identified and you can really begin to see which problems you think you can fix quite easily. As I said, some problems are going to be difficult because they might require organizational change. That's a different type of challenge, but you're certainly going to be fixing anything that's like a low hanging fruit. And it's amazing that in this particular, uh, these studies, all these people had exactly the same problems, whether you were a beginner or whether you were an expert um, across the board. The reported issues. Now, this is a very condensed, high level um, summary of the issues, and I perhaps these will resonate with any of you that have to tackle this type of stuff. Um, yourselves, but like navigation paths uh, in Moodle for us, when you have a system as uh, as big as ours, which I mean, we have a lot of dependency on it for all of our, well, sorry, for most of our digital estate when it comes to accessing asynchronous learning materials and for accessing um, assessment submission points. Um, and sometimes a uh, adjunct faculty could go to a screen that had 85 options you know, which is definitely 84 too many, ideally. Um, and obviously that causes a lot of confusion for new people um, and a lot of time to search through this to find what you want. And sometimes the paths to get to where you want to go to, if you want to get to a submission point to grade student assignments, you might have to go through six or seven pages to get there. Um, and that takes time. Um, because you have to navigate through these 85 options to get down seven pages. Um, and sometimes it happens if you have students in different cohorts, you kind of have to go down seven pages, come back out and go down another seven pages somewhere else for another court. So the amount of time you spent actually getting from A to B in the system is huge. Now, there are lots of other problems like inconsistent breadcrumbs inconsistent resources between different um, cohorts of students and inconsistent language used. Again, all big problems really in a system for anybody who's just looking for, you know, this is poor heuristics, poor um, consistency across the system. Very hard. Uh, junk fact, you would use a lot of terms like, I feel a float <laughs> at sea here. You know, there's no anchoring at all. So consistency is something that's needed to address that. Within, this is our Moodle, okay? So Moodle is straightforward. It's nice and concise. It's straightforward. It shows students their courses and you can get, you can see what you need to do each week and you can see what your percentage completion is in Moodle. So we spent a lot of money customizing Moodle to be able to do this precisely as we wanted. It cost a lot of money to do um, and, you know, it's, reception from students has been very positive. But this is the problem with some LMSs. They're built for students. 
And maybe you were wondering what that picture is about there. <laughs> is it a mistake? <laughs> um, but really, when you look at Moodle, if you think in terms of a restaurant, a customer arrives to a restaurant, they're met at the door, um, you know, by the, the, the house waitress or, or waiter. They bring them to their table. They say, here's your menu and here's your food. It's lovely. But when service people come to the restaurant, they don't, that doesn't happen for them. They go in the back door of the restaurant and they're into a busy kitchen and there's boxes and it's chaos. So that was an analogy really for when, when faculty have to sometimes, or adjunct faculty have to access LMSs, they don't get this nice thing. They kind of end up in scroll of death pages of links of ad hoc tables that have been built. Um, so really the student experience is brilliant in LMS, but sometimes uh, from our experience of Moodle, the faculty is, is a very challenging place. The, the faculty entrance is not good. There's lots of cardboard boxes in there and empty cardboard boxes too. So look, the effects of poor UI and UX really on users is, you know, slow task processing, increased errors, slower onboarding, higher training costs, excessive help desk queries, low morale, high staff turnover. And for us, high staff turnover is one of the things we have to avoid because we spend a lot of time trying to recruit adjunct faculty who are experts in their areas. And we definitely do not want anyone to leave because our systems were a burden to use or just too annoying. Um, you know, so this is very important and something that we have to fix. So I had another question for you now on WooClap. It was on these issues that I just talked about, slow task processing, increased errors. I want to know how frequently do you see these issues for your, for faculty that use your VLE? essentially. So if you have the page opened already um, on your phone or app, you don't need to do anything. If you close it down, you'll probably have to go to wooclap.com again and enter the code. So I'll just give you a few seconds to do that. So wooclap.com and the event code is Z C Q Q. K O. Okay, so I will make the poll available now. So how frequently do the issues I talked about affect your learning management users for faculty? So very good. Um, some very frequently, some occasionally. I assume everyone that answered occasionally has asked their adjunct faculty directly and are not just guessing. Um, okay, thank you for your response. Um, the process that occurred after we collected the information, we designed all our prototypes in, in Figma, if anyone um, is not aware of Figma, it's like a drag and drop. Uh, editor, it's really simple to use and you can build up uh, screens with graphics and it means you don't have to worry about any code or anything. Usually it presents a good kind of connection between the graphic designers on your team um, without the developers being involved, but it's kind of a bridge between the two of them. Um, but essentially you could use anything, you could use PowerPoint to build these mockups if you wanted. But essentially building everything out first and maybe getting a quick pass through um, some members of adjunct faculty to say, look, are, are we honing in? Have we understood you correctly and what you want? And I know this is quite small. I'll show you a bigger version in a minute. Um, you know, ha have we honed in exactly to what, um, what we're going to do here? And it allows you to make final quick tweaks before it moves on to a kind of building it in an actual site in, in, in UI. And as I said, like getting from Figma to the web is, is the challenging bit. I mean, like what I'm talking about here isn't anything new, but 
I've wanted to do a lot of this stuff for um, the 20 years that I've been involved in it, but but I couldn't uh, because it's very hard to do with Moodle. Like if you want to build a cool interface, you can do it, but it will take an incredible amount of investment. And then you really have to, if you don't have a development team, you have to depend on external partners, which is fine. But the, realistically speaking, you're going to have to, any changes you want to make, you have to spec it out. you got to get a price from whoever's going to develop it. you got to come back. And more times than not, uh, for a small college, that might not get past finance. So you've identified problems, but you can't afford to fix them. Um, and although Moodle is a wonderful platform, um, you know, that as I'm, I'm not bashing Moodle here, it plays an absolutely pivotal role in the delivery of open source education, and it does it really well. However, there are other parts of the college, like, um, you know, college related information that just aren't suitable for Moodle anyway. And it, it's probably might not make sense to try and build it into Moodle because you, you, you're you're using a system for what it wasn't meant to be made for anyway. Um, so, you know, to build that type of uh, um, interface, you know, how do we do it? Um, you know, previously we used Drupal, but we ended up in the same place as Moodle. Um, difficult to, expensive to develop, um, difficult for our external partners to find developers, and always a risk of being absolutely tied to external partners to manage your system um, with Drupal. You know, um, you have to wait for them to make the changes and you're on their timeline to a certain degree. So uh, obviously at that point, we took a, a chance to say like, look at WordPress, it's got to see if we can put this in front of Moodle and replace Drupal and see how will it, how, how well will it do. Um, so obviously Gutenberg to the rescue, you know, um, so between this site that has single sign-on um, and Gutenberg, you know, instead of spending a couple of months in a cycle of designing a, an interface and sending it off to be developed and, and back again, this is like, we can do this in a day now. Um, there's no comparison, you know, whether you're dropping native core Gutenberg elements um, or any of, of the private providers under the, it's it's just an ecosystem that's becoming so huge and it really has revolutionized the ability for small teams with very little development knowledge to build custom UIs um, for students. I mean, it, it really is amazing. So that, that is the bridge, that's the thing. That's how you get Figma, you know, the designs that you want. And the whole concept of this home.iberniacollege.website for us is that it is the site that all our students, all our faculty and adjunct faculty log into. And if we've done our job properly, every single thing that you need is gonna be given to you on the page once you log in to help you do your job. That is the goal. And Gutenberg enables that really for a small team um, to do that. And I say a small team without a developer. I think you just need basic WordPress experience. So some examples um, really around the task-based solution. Um, this is an example for our school placement tutors. And I'll show you what this looks like in the wild. Um, really, when a school placement tutor logs in um, to their Hibernia home site, um, you know, they're welcomed by a program director. They, they can get college news updates, that type of thing. But the first thing in their menu, as it detects the role through single sign-on, is what exactly um, what their tasks are. And high up on this interface, this is just a simple, uh, you know, columns in Gutenberg. And um, I think Generate Press is the product used for the accordions. But we've just reflected the tasks that we learned through, through the UX study. What do you need to do first? Well, you know, I need to just remind myself which placement students that I need to be looking out for. Um, and after that, what do you need to do? And um, well, the next thing, when the students are on placement in work practice, I'll need to review their uploads, their reflections. And then I'll need to provide feedback to the students based on those reflections. And then at the end of their placement, I'll need to grade them. So these four steps are the four tasks that this group need to do. Um, so all we've done here is for each particular cohort used an accordion. And when you click a link, it brings you right into the area within the wider VLE where that person needs to do a task. In this case, that link will bring them right to a submission point in Moodle. 
So this is great. I haven't have, had to tell this person how to get to the 10 screens in Moodle or in whatever LMS um, to, to just upgrade, just to mark their submissions or review their student uploads. So it really is just a very simple thing for our team to come along and just update these links as those resources become available in the LMS because it literally takes them five or 10 minutes. But for a member of a junk faculty to not use this method and log into Moodle and or the LMS and, and go down that chain of seven or eight screens to get where they want, that could take longer. It might take an expert 10 minutes, but it might take a newbie half an hour. And if there's 200 adjunct faculty in this group, you can see the time that has been wasted looking for stuff where a simple system like this of signposting almost a white glove service for faculty to say, click here. That will bring you right into that place in the VLE where you need to go. No, no confusion. And there's no training needed, you know? You know, in, in this particular case, because these groups are infrequent users, you, you can watch a video explaining what you're probably likely to do, okay? And all of the UI under that these are all the important parts that come out of whether it's, you know, the key documents and guides to do your job. This is just an example of how easy it is to build these screens and absolutely curate them for a group of people. A second example is for research supervisors. And this uses a forms plugin in particular, it's formidable forms. There are lots of different forms out there, plugins for WordPress. Uh, some uh, definitely a signal of a system failure is when a group of individual interviewees tell you that their method of knowing which students they have are that they're that they're managing are written on a post-it note on their fridge at home. That tells you something's missing uh, from the system. And in, in this particular case, at the beginning of a court, we upload a CSV. To, to that that links students to supervisors, and then when research supervisors log in to their platform, they see just all the students listed for them. It gives them the next date of when their thesis is due, uh, is due, and um, whether they can contact the student because if they're on placements, they can't contact them. And then once they click the view button, we see a very similar thing like the last solution. They see a complete list of the key research dates, but again, just a simple link right into the place where that student's submission is. We don't have to explain to them, well, go to there, go to the research area, go to the cohort, go into the assessment area, go to the submissions area. Mm -mm -mm -mm. You click the link, you jump right in. And yes, our teams do have to maintain this type of system, but the time it takes to maintain it is a fraction of the time required for the errors caused by 200 people trying to do the same thing. And remember, if you contract people to work for 50 hours, you don't want them. You want them to be teaching, learning or, you know, teaching and assessing for 50 hours. You don't want them teaching, learning and assessing for 50 hours, but looking for stuff for 40 hours, because then they're definitely going to, you know, uh, leave. At the end of every page in this system, and when there's an initial induction done with the junk faculty, this, we encourage them to fill out this help us to help you form. Please tell us, because once we finish this project, we move on to a new project. But, you know, all adjunct faculty, you have to give us feedback on these pages. It's the only way things will get better for you. No question is stupid. Please tell us, you know, what you think or if something's not working. So that feedback link is very important. The initial user feedback um, on the placement example that I showed you, um, there was 32 entries, um, not a high amount, but an average star rating of five stars. The feedback comments, you know, this is, I haven't cherry picked these three comments. I promise you all 33 comments were um, very positive. And if anybody wants verification, they can contact me afterwards. But I wanted to, I just picked three of these, you know, isn't when you design a system as a project manager, as a designer, as a web developer, isn't this what you want to see? You want to see feedback from the user of what you just made because you can't guess what they want. 
But if the end user is inspired enough to write comments like this, you've nailed the brief. You know, your your system is, a, your design is a success. And I guess this is obvious to me because I just built a system that I, you know, I asked them what they wanted, they told me, and I built it. So it just shows you that you can't make any assumptions in design. You really have to go right to the end user, no matter who they are. And um, they're the ver they they validate the system directly, and the benefits for you are absolutely immense. And this is reflected too within our engagement stats. You know, some of these pages within that front-facing WordPress site are some of the most popular and used pages on the platform, just behind the digital library for all students or program-related information. So the statistics shows that. There's a great, these pages are good jumping points. We can tell that everybody's coming through them. It provides a wonderful place for us to target information or training to them. So, you know, the evidence is there with the numbers and the stats. So just to reflect on that then, you know, a user-centered design approach makes systems easier to use because they're focused on the needs of the end users and not the systems team. The benefits of good user experience design and good UI design as a result of that is increased and faster user adoption, fewer errors, accelerated return of investment, a more engaged and satisfied workforce, and lower costs generally in terms of development and training as a result. And really the enabler of turning the research that you get from UX into actual UIs is Gutenberg. I mean, this was pretty challenging to do before Gutenberg came along. You needed a web developer on your team to do it, which, which we didn't have. Um, so this allows small teams um, to work with IT to build interfaces quicker than ever before. So one more uh, WooClap, hopefully your page is still opened. Um, and the question is, is Maybe you do this already, and if you do, that's brilliant. I salute you. Um, but if you if you don't, or you you think it could be done more, I guess do you think that your VLE could benefit from the ideas presented here today? So again, go to wooclap.com, and in your event code is Z C Q Q K O. And there's a quiz there that I'm just interested. Okay, so a good mix of one or two. Um, very good, and, and no one has selected three, so everybody feels this is something um, that they can do, and that that is excellent. Um, there are no special skills required. A lot of it, I think, is really common sense. So, thank you very much uh, for listening to me. And if the floor is any questions now, I'd be happy to take them. Hi, great presentation. Quick question. Um, has there been any feedback that you've since worked on since the initial positive feedback, like any additions or removals that you've done based on faculty words? Um, yes, I mentioned three <clears throat> groups of people there. I mentioned research supervisors, success, placement tutors, success, academic tutors, failure, <laughs> complete failure. Um, nothing to do with the interview process was great. Um, the, the data collection element was great, but WordPress couldn't fix some of the solutions that these guys needed. And it required more organize, organizational change and systems change. For example, really what academic tutors need in this example for us 
our central calendar is the Moodle calendar. And again, it's great for students, but if you're a tutor on multiple programs, that calendar is spaghetti junction for you. So what we need is a much more central, more sophisticated calendar application um, that can tell a person what's exactly happening for them at any point. But until we have a feed like that, then it won't be appearing WordPress. It won't be appearing anywhere. Um, so yes, there is an ongoing review with academic tutors now to go in and completely weed out anything that's just not successful in their area and approach this again with a fresh, a fresh lens um, and some fresh vigor.